turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. You know, Steve just said he was one of the biggest sinners, right? So at the, Friday, or at the Wednesday night Bible study last week, I mentioned the fact that when I was a kid, my grandfather was the grave digger for Arvin Cemetery. And I remember him taking me down there when he was working. And I would walk around the cemetery and I'd see all these, uh, you know, the, the, what are they called? <laughs> Headstones. <Yeah. laughs> I'm old, sorry. Uh, headstones, they say things like virtuous and beloved and all that kind of stuff. And as a little kid, I wondered, where are all the Ogdens buried? Uh, you know, there's got to be someplace, right? All right. When I first graduated from California Baptist College, now university, and returned to Bakersfield, I started teaching the college and careers Sunday school class for young adults at the church that I had attended before I went away to college. It was there that I unintentionally swam out into the dangerous waters of biblical disagreement amongst Christians. You see, I taught my Sunday school class that Christians are freely forgiven forever in the sacrifice of Christ. I taught them that when they became a Christian, all of the sins they would ever commit were forgiven in the sacrifice of Christ, even the ones they had not sinned as yet. I still teach this, by the way. But the deacons of my church did not agree. Uh, they were afraid that if I taught these young people that all of their sins were forgiven, that they would basically be given a get out of free jail card or get out of jail free card and they would just go wild. And so what they did instead of confronting me directly is they decided to send a young associate pastor they had just hired into my classroom to challenge me in front of my class and to discredit me in front of my class. And the passage that the associate pastor chose for that very purpose is the passage we study today. Because this passage seems to suggest that forgiveness is conditional. And if forgiveness is conditional, you cannot be freely forgiven forever, which was what I was teaching. He said there were conditions to being forgiven. And Jesus gives one of the conditions here in the Sermon on the Mount, and John gives another condition to being forgiven later on in, the, in his epistle. Are you ever confused <laughs> about this whole subject of forgiveness in Christianity, the finality of forgiveness? When you became a Christian, did... God forgive you of all your sins, meaning all the sins you would ever commit, or did he only forgive you of all the sins you had committed up to the point when you became a Christian? And then if you commit any new sins, you have to be, ask for forgiveness for those sins. When I was a kid, it seemed like on some occasions I heard sermons about how all of my sins were forgiven. And then on other occasions, I was taught that I was still in need of God's forgiveness in some way. And I found this confusing. <laughs> Am I forgiven or not? And when you have insecurity about forgiveness, about your standing before God, it results in fears and worries about God punishing you for unforgiven sins. So it creates, in my opinion, insecurity. That insecurity cannot help but create a feeling of emotional distance from God. So let's read what Jesus says here in the Sermon on the Mount and try to decipher what he means. Matthew 6, beginning in verse 12. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from 
the evil one. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. So the associate pastor who was sent as a mole into my classroom asked me in front of my class how forgiveness could be forever if Jesus says here in Matthew 6, if you do not forgive men their sins, your father will not forgive your sins. He then threw in 1 John 1, 9 for good measure, which says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us, will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. So this young associate pastor stated that the verse in Matthew says, in order to be forgiven, I have to forgive others. And according to what John says in 1 John, I must confess any new sins I commit, and then afterward, God forgives me of those sins and purifies me from all unrighteousness. So now this associate pastor had just pointed out to my class that not only is forgiveness not forever, there are at least two conditions, forgiving others and confessing my sins, asking for forgiveness. So was he right? Does God actually condition my forgiveness on if I forgive others and also upon my confessing my sins and asking for forgiveness? If confession is necessary to purify me from all unrighteousness, as 1 John suggests, the implication is that by not confessing, I would be left in an impure, unrighteous state. Well, if that is in fact the case, if that is in fact the way it works, then how is our concept of forgiveness really different from Catholic theology on forgiveness? You see, in Catholic theology, one is constantly fluctuating between an, a pure and an impure state depending upon whether one has taken advantage of the means of grace in the Catholic Church, which are things like confession and partaking of the Eucharist. Those are the things you have to do in order to keep yourself in a state of grace, to keep yourself pure. It's how you clean the slate every week or every day. If you die without your slate being clean, then you get to clean it in purgatory because forgiveness is conditional. Now, let's just admit there's no getting around the fact that Jesus' words here imply that God does not forgive unconditionally. However, if that is true, if that is true, why did Paul so confidently assure me that when I became a Christian, I received forgiveness unconditionally by the grace of God? When, in point of fact, Jesus was now telling me that I needed to do something in order to stay forgiven. Paul was apparently a big fat liar when he presented my forgiveness as a past event that's already been settled rather than an ongoing event. Well, where does Paul present forgiveness for the Christian as a past event? And here's the thing you need to realize. For the Christian, everywhere in the Bible where a Christian's forgiveness is referred to, it's always, always referred to in the past tense. Always referred to in the past tense. Let's take a look at some of those places. So, in Ephesians 1 and verse 7, Paul wrote... In him, what do we have? Redemption. How? Through his blood. And what is redemption through his blood? The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. In Ephesians 4.32, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ Christ. 
God forgave you. Then he writes the same way when he writes to the church at Colossae, Colossians 1.14, in whom we have redemption. What is redemption? The forgiveness of sins. Colossians 2.13, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature or flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all, all, forgave all our sins. Colossians 3.13, bear with one another and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. Now, what does Paul say that we have? He says that we have the forgiveness of sins in redemption. Is that not what he says? That's exactly what he says. We have forgiveness in Christ. That means we already possess it. What do we already possess? Forgiveness of sins. Do you know what you don't need? Something you already possess. Paul also says we are to forgive as God forgave you. Past tense, not forgive as God forgives you. Do you see the difference between what Paul writes and what Jesus says? Jesus said we are to forgive so the Father will also forgive you. Paul says, in talking about the very same subject, we are to forgive others as the Lord forgave you. Well, if our forgiveness is ongoing instead of settled, as some suggest, Paul should have written, forgive as God forgives you, because that would mean it was ongoing. Jesus and Paul appear to contradict one another, so how do we explain the apparent contradiction? Well, let's start with the Sermon on the Mount passage. What did Jesus mean when, in speaking of forgiveness here in Matthew 6? I'm going to give you four different explanations of what he possibly meant. And the first explanation is this. The context of Matthew is not judicious. That means that he's, Jesus is not talking about legal forgiveness. He's speaking about familial, family, relational forgiveness. It has nothing to do with your salvation. This view notes that God is being addressed as father, which places the context in a family setting, not a legal setting. Therefore, Jesus is saying in the context of family life with our father and our brothers and sisters in Christ, we may need to be forgiven or we may need to forgive. And in this view, forgiveness, is basically the equivalent of dealing with any relational disharmony within the family. Relational forgiveness is the way you restore family fellowship and family harmony. An example of someone who holds this view would be Dr. John MacArthur, who says, quote, believers cannot know the parental, parental forgiveness, notice how he places it in the family situation, parental forgiveness, which keeps fellowship with the Lord rich and blessings from the Lord profuse apart from forgiving others in heart and word. So what he is saying is that an unforgiving believer forfeits their fellowship with God and their blessings from God. So note in this view, a believer is seeking only relational or family or parental forgiveness from the Father in order to keep fellowship or remain in harmony with the Father and continue to receive his blessings. The second explanation of this passage is that the text is communal, not individual. Because Jesus says, forgive us our debts, not forgive me my debts. He doesn't say you should pray this way, forgive me my debts. He says you should pray this way, forgive us our debts. And so the prayer is meant to be a prayer of the church gathered, 
not an individual prayer. The whole prayer is a corporate prayer of the church gathered. So Jesus is saying that when a church gathers, it should pray this prayer if there is any lack of forgiveness in the church. Otherwise, God will remove his blessings upon the church, which is to say he won't answer their prayers. The third explanation is this text is judicious. It is talking about legal forgiveness, not familial or relationship forgiveness. This view says, look, this passage says exactly what it appears to say. The teaching of the verse can be given in one simple sentence. Unless you forgive others, God will not forgive you and you will go to hell. There is nothing hidden here. Only something that we prefer not to believe. Jesus is saying in this view exactly what he means. Unless you forgive, you will not be forgiven. Theologian D.A. Carson in his commentary on the Sermon on the Mount believes that the context is judicious. And in his view, the unforgiving person give, gives evidence by their lack of forgiveness that they are not really a Christian. And this is why God does not forgive them because they're not really saved in the first place. So in this view, an unwillingness to forgive others is evidence that you are not saved. The fourth explanation, and this is the one that I hold to, is the text is to be viewed from the context of the old covenant perspective, not the new covenant perspective. Under the old covenant, God's forgiveness was conditional. And this is the context of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus was born under the law, according to what Paul wrote to the churches of Galatia. Therefore, Jesus lived under the old covenant, not the new covenant. Now, this can be confusing to us because we have a tendency to think if something is in the New Testament, that it's new covenant. But that's not the case. That is not the case at all. The Gospels are a part of the Old Covenant. They're still living under the Old Covenant during the Gospel period. The New Covenant doesn't begin until Jesus dies. Here in a moment, we're going to be celebrating the Lord's Supper. One of the things the Lord says in his supper is, this cup is the New Covenant in my blood. Well, if the new covenant is in his blood, it means he has to die first. The new covenant doesn't begin until Jesus dies. With the, the author of Hebrews makes that abundantly clear. The people listening to this sermon are under the law. They're not under grace. And the law formula is conditional. The law said, this is how you were forgiven under the old covenant if someone brings a lamb as their sin offering they are to bring a female without defect they are to lay their hand <coughs> on its head and slaughter it for a sin offering at the place where the burnt offering is slaughtered then you get down to verse 35 it says in this way the priest will make atonement for them for the sin they have committed and they will be forgiven so forgiveness under the law, under the old covenant, was conditional, and it was temporary. People under the law had to ask for their sins to be forgiven on a regular basis by bringing sacrifices. This was still the practice when Jesus was delivering this sermon. Therefore, Jesus is simply giving his listeners the current conditions of forgiveness under which they live, which is the law system. Only under the new covenant are we completely forgiven. Now, personally, I find explanation number one and explanation number four to be the most preferred uh, explanations, at least in my opinion. But again, I actually hold to this last explanation I gave, explanation number four. Now, <clears throat> some of you may be wondering, well, why do you accept uh, explanation number one, which concerns relational forgiveness. 
That view is acceptable to me because the forgiveness sought and asked for is not judicial or legal forgiveness. Or to put it differently, your salvation in that view is not in jeopardy, only your fellowship or communion with God. So while I disagree with the perspective that only relational forgiveness is in view in the Matthew passage, I like the fact that we are agreed that a Christian salvation is not in question. In their view, the sin of unforgiveness in today's passage is only a wedge between fellowship and harmony of a Christian with God the Father and their brothers and sisters in Christ. They also believe <coughs> that in asking for forgiveness, you are simply, it's just a way to restore family, harmony, fellowship, and blessing. I do not have any problem with people asking for forgiveness in this sins. My main concern is that you do not have a Catholic understanding of forgiveness that says by not confessing your sins and asking for forgiveness, you enter into some kind of unforgiven state, a state of ungrace. However, I am convinced that this is not the context of what Jesus says here in Matthew 6. The Sermon on the Mount is given in the context of the Old Covenant where everyone is still under the law, and as such, they were, in fact, temporarily and conditionally forgiven. Only after the cross, when we are now under the new covenant, are we taught by Paul to consider our forgiveness as a past event, not an ongoing event. All right, well, that may explain the Matthew passage, but what about 1 John 1, 9? Why does John appear to say that we must confess our sins in order to be forgiven and purified? Well, let's talk about that. <laughs> Time does not allow me to fully explore 1 John 1, 9, but it does say if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Now, here again, there are two major views. For those who believe that forgiveness is relational, not judicial, they also apply that here in 1 John and they say the context of 1 John is fellowship. They believe that John is comparing two kinds of Christians in 1 John. And the two kinds of Christians that he's comparing are, there are Christians who are out of fellowship due to sin, and they won't confess their sin in order to get back into fellowship. And there are Christians who, when they sin and get out of fellowship with God, they confess their sins and ask for forgiveness, and they get back into fellowship with God. So that is what they believe is being compared and contrasted here in 1 John. The other view, which is one I hold to, believes that John is not contrasting two kinds of Christians. Instead, John is contrasting those who are merely claiming to be Christians with those who really are Christians. John's point in this view is he's instructing believers, this is how you discern if a person claiming to be a Christian is actually a Christian. They give evidence of spiritual life. He then lists the types of things that distinguish a real Christian from a person merely claiming to be a Christian. And basically he says, look, real Christians admit they are sinners and, and came to Jesus to be cleansed of all sin, all sin and all unrighteousness. People merely claiming to be Christians do not admit they are sinners. So it all sort of boils down to whether you think John is describing a Christian in 1 John 1 in verses 6, 8, and 10 when he says that that person claiming to be a Christian walks in darkness, lies, does not live by the truth, claims to be without sin, deceives themselves, the truth is not in them, claims they have not sinned, make God out to be a liar, and his word has no place in their lives. Let's say I came to you and I said, hey, I know someone who's claiming to be a Christian, but hear me out, 
They walk in darkness, they lie, they do not live by the truth, they claim to be without sin, they deceive themselves, the truth is not in them, they claim they have not sinned, they make God out to be a liar, and the word, his word has no place in their lives. And then I ask you, do you think that there might really be a Christian? Are you going to say, yep, (laughs) that sounds like a Christian to me. The people who hold to the fellowship view have to believe that is a description of a Christian in sin. Now, when you're in sin, tell me this. Do you, is that that stuff true of you? When you sin? When you sin, do you claim to be without sin? Do you claim you have not sinned? You make God out to be a liar and his word has no place in your life. You lie. Do not live by the truth. It just makes more sense to me if that is the description of a person merely claiming to be a Christian. Therefore, I do not think fellowship is the main context of 1 John. Because the word fellowship is only mentioned four times in John's epistle. And it's not mentioned at all after verse 7. It's only mentioned in the first chapter. It's mentioned four times. It's not mentioned again after verse 7. The word life or lives is mentioned in every chapter of John's epistle. It's mentioned chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5. For a a, a total of 26 times. So I believe that is a greater case for that being the context than fellowship. So John's main concern, at least in my view is not whether a person has fellowship, but whether a person lives in such a way so as to show evidence that they truly possess spiritual life, or if they live in such a way so as to demonstrate they merely claim to possess spiritual life. Now back to our text in the Sermon on the Mount. Just because I believe that what Jesus is saying here is an old covenant concept, it doesn't mean that I don't think we have anything to learn from what he says here. The Bible says that all scripture is profitable. So there are principles here we can learn from. What is often lost in this debate is the clause, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And how does this relate to being forgiven our debts and forgiving others their debts? The last four petitions of the prayer are connected Let's take a quick look at them. So I have to reintroduce the verse we covered last week, verse 11. Give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Now last week we saw that by asking God to give us our daily bread, we're asking him to provide us with everything we need to sustain our life spiritually and physically. He's giving us our daily bread, not only in a physical sense, but emotionally and spiritually each and every day. We thereby acknowledge the fact that we are completely dependent upon him and nothing else, which is why I think we're expected to forgive our debtors. You see, when I refuse to forgive a debt I'm owed, then I'm not really looking to God as the only one who really gives me my provision of daily bread. I'm saying, God, I need my daily bread, but I also need this debt paid that this person owes me. This leads me into temptation and places me at the mercy of the evil one. 
The most common word for forgiveness in the New Testament is a word that means to release or to set free. Our word resentment means to feel again and again and again. And those are your choices. You either release the debt of sin and set it free, or you feel it over and over again because you would not release it. Now, <laughs> let's, let's just be honest with one another here for a moment. We obviously do this imperfectly. Sometimes I think I have released a debt only to discover a little nagging pain in the back of my mind that suggests I really haven't released the debt completely. And because I haven't really released the debt completely, it's very easy to stir back up those feelings of resentment. So I find with this issue of forgiveness, I have many starts and stops. I try to do it. I take it back. I try it again. Because I can't do it perfectly. I can only do it imperfectly. Because I'm not God. I can only forgive imperfectly. Only God forgives perfectly because only God loves perfectly. And I think maybe, maybe, that's okay that we have this struggle. And maybe the Lord lets us have this struggle because it's just there to remind us of this great gift we have received in Christ of being freely forgiven forever. The simple fact of the matter is this. I practice love poorly. And I'm in relationship with a lot of people who also practice love poorly. And because we all practice love poorly, forgiveness is always going to be necessary in the relationships I have in this life. You see, forgiving one another is the way, by grace, we fill in the gaps of the love we practice poorly. You cannot have a relationship with your spouse without forgiveness. You cannot have a relationship with your children or with your parents without forgiveness. You can't have a relationship with your friends and neighbors without forgiveness. With God, we are freely forgiven forever, but with one another, we have to make a choice moment by moment to forgive or to hold on to it. And we neither forgive easily nor find ourselves easily forgiven. And what Jesus and Paul tell us is that when we do that, we actually give Satan a foothold in our life. We make a place for him to launch an attack against us by our unforgiving hearts. You think you've given Satan a hold in your life? Is that something you can't release? Is there something this morning that you need to release so you can move on? You know, sometimes the debtor, you won't let off the hook, is you. <laughs> 
Are you still punishing yourself for some irrevocable past action? Paul writes of the importance of forgiving others to the church at Corinth. In 2 Corinthians 2, he says, if anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. He, this person was expelled from the church for a while. Now instead, apparently he repented. You ought to forgive and comfort him. Why? So that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Some of you overwhelmed by excessive sorrow because you cannot forgive or you feel like someone won't forgive you. Paul says, look, I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote to you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there is anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. Why? In order that Satan may not outwit us. For we are not unaware of his schemes. Most people believe this is talking about the man in 1 Corinthians 5 who committed a horrible sin. And it was a horrible sin, sleeping with his stepmother. But you know, one of the most interesting things about that horrible situation referred to by Paul in his letters to the church at Corinth, you're gonna struggle with this, is that Paul never says the man needs God's forgiveness. He never says that man needs to ask God to forgive him. He only speaks of the church needing to forgive him. And says, if we don't, we allow Satan an opportunity to outwit us. So in summary, Jesus, living under the old covenant before the cross, refers to forgiveness as conditional because it was conditional at the time of his sermon. Jesus states a person living under the old covenant should forgive if they expect to be forgiven. After the cross, Paul changes this concept to a person should forgive because they have already been forgiven. Just as forgiveness is initially a barrier between God and man, it is also a constant barrier between men and women. Because before reconciliation can occur, there first must be forgiveness. Amen? Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Praise team could come forward at this time. I'm going to pray, and then Steve uh, Ogden's going to come up, and we're going to say a prayer for Phil McLaughlin before we partake of communion this morning. Uh, just so you know, Phil's having cancer treatment. He's going to be gone for 28 days uh, here pretty quick, so we want to pray for him before he goes. Um, it's a new treatment, so... We obviously want that to be very successful. Um, if, you're, if this is the first time you've been with us when we are partaking of communion, uh, when Juan and the praise team begin worship later on, uh, we'll be passing out the elements of communion. We do the two cup method here, which means you'll be given, when you pick up the cups out of the tray, there's actually two cups that are stacked and the bottom cup has the bread and the top cup has uh, the juice. We ask that you partake of communion when you are ready and uh, make sure that
that your heart is right and uh, that you reflect upon where you are at this moment in your spiritual relationship with God. Some of you may want to think about what was said today in, in his word. We also have prayer partners in the back if any of you would like to be prayed with or for. And now before Steve comes up, let us pray. Father, so grateful. I, I don't, I don't really understand why some people don't want to accept the fullness, the freeness, the foreverness of your forgiveness. Why we would want to try to walk out into this world unsure of if we are forgiven or not. It just seems to me it's better to have that settled in our hearts and minds. That we are forgiven freely, fully, forever. And now all we have to do is act like it. by depending upon your love and grace, which empowers us to do what we cannot do on our own. This morning, we think back upon that moment when we were first forgiven of all of our sins. That's why we participate in communion, to remember there was a time when I was a sinner separated from God. And all of my sins laid a heavy burden upon me and I didn't know how to get rid of that burden. But in your cross, you said, give that burden to me. I will bear it, I will pay for it. You won't ever, ever have to worry about it again. That should fill our hearts with joy this morning, Lord. I pray if anyone here is struggling with this issue, that your spirit helps them to release it this morning. We'll be quick to give you the praise and glory for all this in Jesus' name. 